So we are live and we can say welcome to Azure MVP Unplugged 4th edition, this time regionally. I'm very glad that here in the call we have uh, currently Stanislav, uh, Anton Boyko, Radu Vunvulea, Evelyn Andreev, and we are waiting also for Michal and Emil from Poland hope that they will join us a little bit later. Welcome, guys. Welcome. Welcome. Hi, guys. Our idea is to start with some topics which we prepared, and uh, depending on questions from the chat, we can continue with some additional uh, Q&A depending on what is interesting for our attendees and, and uh, my suggestion is to uh, start with one very interesting hot topic about cloud adoption and migration. Radu is uh, one of the experts there so Radu if you can share something it will be really great. Okay, hi, uh, hello everybody. If you have any kind of questions, please just uh, uh, type them on the chat but more easily to drive the discussion. So I would say that if we had five or eight years ago cloud as a uh, lot, we had a cloud as a lot of noise and everybody was talking about cloud now, especially starting from last year with working from home and the digitalization that we have nowadays, uh, cloud migration is one of the most common topics. I wouldn't call it cloud adoption. I would go more on cloud, I wouldn't call it cloud migration. I would go more on the cloud adoption. And why? Because many times people are talking about uh, migration, things like that, and, we, and when, when we go deeper with the discussion, you realize, well, it's not about migration because you don't want to keep too much from your own prime system. You just want to improve your agility, how fast you can deliver new, uh, new version of the product to the market and so on. And yes, sometimes we're talking about cloud migration that are the classical one like lift and shift and things like that. And I had a very interesting story that happened today about uh, a migration from on-prem to cloud. I was talking with a startup, a local startup that is based in Romania, a very interesting one on IoT, improving and reinventing the way how you can do remote monitoring of your physical factories, of your devices, and how fast you're producing different uh, uh, things and so on. So it's more on the manufacturing part. And I was talking with the guys and they were talking about their amazing on-prem solution that they have now. They that are hosting on, on a small, um, infrastructure provider from uh, Romania. It's small comparison with other cloud vendors, but for local, uh, for, uh, uh, for local presence, they are, they are pretty big. And we're talking about the prices and they, were, and they said, well, we have a very good price for it per month. And I said, okay, let's, let, let's see how much you pay for what you are paying and so on. We realized that every month they pay around 2000 euros. It's not too much. It's a pretty acceptable amount of money for all of their customers. So I said, okay, let's see how much would cost you inside Azure. In, initially, the initial cost was around 3,000 euros. And this is something that usually is happening when you're doing a lift and shift. The price of uh, taking the on-prem infrastructure without changing anything, especially if you don't have peaks and you have the same load all the time, it's the same. And we said, okay. 3,000 versus 2,000, they said, okay, it's 50% more. Why would I would go to Azure? And I said, okay, let's take a look on what are the resources that, that, that you are using on-prem, how you are do, using them, and so on. And what we realized very fast that just doing a lift and shift without doing any kind of changes, changes and doing some optimization about how many resources they would consume, we went from 3,000 to 1,800 1, euros. It's not a big difference, but now their on-prem to Azure costs are the same without, having, without doing anything else around it. Why they uh, want Arado, to... Yes, please. I have one question because it is really something which is pain point how to 
estimate the cost and how to optimize the resources. It is actually the selling point how you can uh, make migration to the cloud. Can yes. you share some insights here? Okay, so uh, let me share my personal my personal way of doing the, the migration estimation, especially when you're talking with a, with a new possible customer or with a new company that they, they have some uh, issues from the cost point of view migrating to a cloud vendor and so on. Uh, how you should start a discussion and in most of the cases, they don't want to do changes in application and you don't want to change the way how their current application is running because it means more investment in uh, development and so on. You, you can go very simple, just do an initial estimation about taking the same uh, infrastructure resources that they're using on-prem and try to do a match on the cloud. This is what was the first ex exercise, or let's say the first step. And the first step in our case was 200, 2000 on-prem to 3000 to inside Azure. Well, it was okay-ish, but still 50% more. So it wouldn't be acceptable and they wouldn't have a, a real incentive why they would go to cloud. Even uh, so, hello? yes. For what type of solutions are you are you talking about? I mean, from solution to solution is different, but if you are an independent software provider, uh, you are or you are um, developing a product and you are considering to host your product, or you are just moving a kind of infrastructure like uh, VMs. What kind of resources are we talking about, and what type of business? Yeah. So uh, the type of resources that they were looking to do the migration, uh, the initial resources were pure virtual machines. So virtual, virtual, virtual mar machines on top of a VM of a VM uh, VMware cluster, where the, from the local infrastructure provider they received a specific number of machines where they had uh, deployed uh, the database, uh, the business layer, and very important the reporting part because they are doing a lot of data analytics and also the, the UI and everything that is posing the API, the dashboards, and so on. Um, the type of the business domain from, the, from which they are part on, they are, they are part of uh, manufacturing uh, solution. So basically it's an IoT uh, solution for manufacturing, for, for large factories that are producing different things, especially the ones that they have robots or any kind of devices that can be plugged to a USB, to a COM, or to, or, to, or to a serial connector from where they can fetch data. Okay, I hope that I was able to respond to your question. Let's go now forward. So we were, in the, after the first step, we were 2,000 versus 3,000 3, euros. And we're talking only a lift and shift, a one-to-one -one migration without doing any kind of things behind the scenes. So just taking, let's assume that there were 10 virtual machines and taking the 10 virtual machines and running them in similar uh, virtual machines from Microsoft Azure. So it was 2,000 to 3,000 euros. Now, the next step was looking on uh, the load on that machines. And I mean CPU, uh, memory, and disk. And what we observed that there were specific trends, especially for uh, especially when data are pushed to the platform, it was around from especially from seven to five p.m. So that that was the peak for data for data collecting, for monitoring part, and for different employees that are looking on. Uh, dashboard, the current status, and so on, we see that the peak is usually around 9, 9.30, during the lunch break, from 12 to 1, 1.30, and after that around 4, uh, or 4 to 5, especially for the ones that have two different shifts that are working in the factory, and we said, okay, it means that, for example, during the night, because most of your factory, most of your client and customers don't have the factory open during the night, then you can start to play. So you can do some downscaling of the VMs from the number of VMs and so on. And from there, we were able to reduce the number of uh, workload that they need behind the scene to be able to run the uh, platform. This was the initial exercise. And we reached around 
2,400 euros or something like that, from 3,000 to, 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 to 2,400. The third uh, step that we've done were to analyze two items. The first one was the database because their current solution was had only one instance, basically one powerful VM where the database was uh, running. And the second thing was the data analytics part. Now, uh, because it's a startup, don't think about that they will need very exotic solutions like managing instances or signups for data analytics and so on. The reality that they on prem they were using SQL, SQL Server. And the match to Azure SQL instances was very natural. And from there we started to go to 1,000 uh, to 1,800 euros, so we won around five to 600 euros just by switching from physical uh, from virtual machines where we were running SQL to Azure SQL instances, that they were a little bit optimized, and we especially we analyze how many resources we need for them, depending on the peak hours and so on. The fourth step that we didn't had time, and we said that we will analyze later on because it will impact the way how they are uh, uh, generating the reports and especially they it especially also it is affecting uh, the data marts and also the er model that they have would be uh, to change a little bit the way how they creating the data vault used for the reporting part and that would be pretty interesting to see if uh, they could go somewhere more closer to a power bank. It might, might, not, might not work. And I expect that in the next one or two years, they, they wouldn't go to a more uh, mature reporting solution because the current solution that they have now works pretty well. And they invested a lot of resources already in how they do the data, data analytics and also how they are uh, showing the church, the uh, charts, the report, and so on. Even so, if, if the startup would spin up and they would have and they would grow or they could uh, win large organizations that they have multiple factories and they need a bunch of reports and a lot of analytics, I see a more natural migration in that case to signups or to Power BI, but it's something that they need, uh, business need to be able to do this. So after the first step that I said, we were able to reduce the cost to be very close to the one that they have now on on-prem. The thing that they, they don't have on on-prem, and there are some things that they were pretty excited, especially if we remember one or two weeks ago, the story of, uh, of, a, of a private data center from Germany that uh, went fire or something like that and one of the gaming platform lost almost no lost all the data of their users for one of their games they they, they, were, they were trying to do exactly exactly this try to avoid this kind of situation especially if they would lose the data vaults for their customers the historical data basically and this was very important for them and this is why they started to look to a, to a cloud vendor in, a, in this case to azure so the next the thing that they are getting are basically backups in different locations backups especially of the data of the customer data and also uh, they are thinking about a possible dr at this moment in time they don't need a full dr solution the most important thing for them is to not lose the data that they already have historical data of their customers and you could think about and what i see normally in the discussion especially we or you as a technical person are pushing as near real-time backups don't lose any kind of data what is important in this kind of migration scenario or cloud adoption discussion you what you need to take into account and how you should uh, go with the discussion it's not about how fast you want this kind of backups? What is the minimal uh, uh, RTO and RPO that you need? No, it's about if, for example, you lose data for the last day, would it impact the business? And I was surprised that in, in their case, they said, well, if we lose the data for the current day from our customers, it is fine. Nobody will complain. We'll, we'll understand. We will still be under our SLAs. So, we went in a discussion, okay, we will have a backup, we have a have database backup that are done 
every one hour it was the initial discussion. One day they said, okay, it's, if, we, if we can go better, it's fine. So we will have Azure backups, uh, backups of the data done every one hour. And for and for them, it is more than in, in enough. We don't need to go to close as second and things like that. And they already have a better SLA than the, than the current one. Uh, and this is uh, this iteration where when we are more close to a lift and shift, we don't take into account to do any kind of changes in the application. So, for example, changing the way how their solution are running uh, and everything that is behind the scene. For example, they, do, they don't use at this moment in time a microservice or a service approach. They are ready for it, but they are not yet there. And adding on top of the migration, Another layer of going to a Microsoft to a microservices approach would be too stretchy for for them. So small steps driven by uh, business needs. The first step to have a similar cost to the one that they have on prem with the better backups and a possible DR solution. Why I say a possible DR solution? Because on the current solution they don't have a DR and a failover strategy. For the next gen, they are taking into account, but they need to take a look on the cost. Because of the startup, any kind of failover solution that they would add would add around 40, 50% of extra cost of their current uh, monthly infrastructure and the uh, running cost of their solution. So they're they are trying to cut the cost as much as, uh, as much as uh, possible. Uh, what I usually all the time recommend, try to identify the business KPIs and what drives the business to do that migration and try to follow them. Even if uh, it's very easy to push better SLAs or to push better quality attributes, be sure, be sure that the customer uh, is ready to pay for them and he really needs them. Because each small thing that you would add would add an extra cost at the end of the migration of or of the adoption that they will do and this would add extra cost to the ex, to the migration exercise or to the migration program that you that they would that they would be involved in and try to think about a multi stage and in multiple in a multi a multiple phase migration where each step is motivated by a clear business need perfect Thank you very much, Rado, for the explanation. It was really very important and I think helpful for many people who will watch this uh, streaming. And uh, my suggestion is to go to the next hot topic, which is related to uh, actually how to publish to the marketplace uh, your applications in Azure. And here, Evelyn well, uh... and yeah, uh, so sort of interrupting, Mikhail. So, if I may, I would like to contribute a bit to the story that Rodo was telling because uh, I do okay. have yeah, quite uh, quite an interesting and to some degree even a funny experience. Uh, what will happen if you will miss the proper design phase of that migration and how it could actually backfire? So, I do believe that it will need like two or three minutes to describe. So, I was working with the client and uh, we were basically hosting quite a big platform in Azure. We were using web apps as an underlying hosting platform. And to just give you kind of a glimpse of how big that platform was, on our production in total, we had more than 50 instances uh, of uh, web apps based on a premium plan so the platform was quite big and of course because we want to optimize on cost on all non-production environments what we did uh, we basically created a rules technically you cannot shut down the web app as you can do with the virtual machine but what you can do with the web app you can stop it and then you can scale it down to the cheapest pricing tier outside your working hours so in that case you will still have a pretty much good economy uh, and mean like a very much good savings on your non-production environments in addition to that we had this basically schedule to turn them off uh, outside business hours and turn them on back again for non-production. And for the production, we also have the auto scale configured in case the amount of traffic will suddenly 
popped up because maybe someone run the marketing campaign or something like that. So now the user starts basically uh, showing on the website more and more. So, but the bad design decision that was made like a few years ago at this project was the following. So they were deciding to host production and non-production within the same issue subscription. And on this one, guys, I will recommend you always to consult with the Microsoft best practices because uh, how it became an issue after the two years. After the two years, it happens that actually uh, on Microsoft Azure, and I do believe on other cloud providers as well, you do have some internal thresholds. And in Azure, they are in the scope of one subscriptions. And those thresholds are basically saying that, uh, let's say, in one hour, you cannot request to provision more than X amount of web apps, let's say, or more than X amount of CPU cores for your virtual machines, okay? So Microsoft usually do that to protect themselves from someone, you know, like getting in and saying, I want like a million of CPU cores next minute. So what was happening? Uh, someone run the marketing campaign, but they decide to run it uh, early morning, basically the same time uh, when we were scaling up our non-production environment, which was there on the same subscription. So our environments were scaling up and at the same time, the users starts basically, you know, like uh, going to the website and our auto scale engine on the web app was uh, unable to, yeah. And did you actually say scale up or you actually meant uh, scale oh, out? Sorry, I mean, I, sorry, I meant scale out. Yeah, thanks. That, and for this clarification, yeah, I actually meant scale out. So our auto scale engine was unable to scale out and was unable to provision more and more resources just because those internal thresholds. So of course, uh, in terms of let's say damage, that was not truly kind of a big impact. Uh, the user experience downgraded a bit uh, and we were unable to comply with our performance targets. So now it took not less than, let's say, one second to render a web page, but it took like two or three seconds to render the web page. But in general, that was an extremely, extremely good experience for the client. And that was an exact proof that they need to basically show that we need to separate our production and non-production environments so yeah that was basically my story which i do believe that perfectly through that part that shot was talking about and yeah thanks guys for your attention mikhail back to you we can move to another topic now thank you very much i see that also michael is already here sorry michael there was some issue with the link it seems and uh, we already started, but I think that you are joining in the exact time because uh, Michael has very good expertise in several domains, which we will discuss a little bit uh, later, like uh, disaster recovery, like uh, hybrid cloud. So we will talk about this a little bit later. But now I would like to go related to how to publish your Azure applications into Azure Marketplace. The topic which actually Evelyn Reist and Evelyn and Stanislav probably can share some good insights related to this uh, problem. It is not a small problem related to many details, related to payment, related to integration with Microsoft. So guys, I really will appreciate if you can share some information about this. Okay, thanks, Michael. Uh, I think that I, will, I could start sharing the problem, uh, but I think that uh, Stan is much more competent to make uh, uh, comments on it. Uh, first of all, because uh, we are working with uh, banks, uh, for example, and uh, there is a challenge really to uh, to convert banks to to using Azure, uh, any solution in Azure. Uh, 
uh, even when you are talking about uh, training a machine learning service, uh, uh, even the training part in Azure is a problem, although you could export the model and later uh, go for inference uh, on uh, on premises. Uh, so in a, in a kind of a transition to what we started with uh, with Rado, I would, uh, uh, we're using Azure from a different perspective. We're using it uh, because of the services. We're using it because the services are um, ready with high uh, SLA level, uh, scalable, and uh, this uh, uh, and uh, Microsoft uh, invest uh, heavily in there. And this allows us to move uh, fast in and uh, making new implementations and placing them uh, uh, on the market. Uh, currently, our challenge is that uh, we are targeting uh, small and medium enterprises. Uh, we uh, have in infrastructure as a code with uh, a lot of uh, uh, ARM templates and uh, and PowerShell and unfortunately some manual steps because it appears that we have to invest really uh, hundreds of, uh, of hours uh, to improve work which could be done within uh, 15 minutes or uh, or so. But this prevents us from scaling, from uh, from uh, making a scalable business. So it it is different when you serve a single customer. is different uh, from the um, case when you're having a product and you want to make this uh, product available for multiple customers. So this is uh, different uh, business models. So from our perspective, you want to use uh, the services and want to deploy these services in uh, in the customer subscription because there is still such uh, mm, uh, some level of uh, um, doubt that the cloud is uh, secure enough. I would like to also add something to what Radu said. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are aware of a thing called Azure Confidential Computing. And uh, also there is uh, one uh, SDK for um, for the confi uh, for the confidential uh, computing, um, uh, what was what was the name of uh, of it? Enclave SDK, uh, where you could uh, have uh, your workload in a VM, and uh, you could think this uh, VM to be a, a kind of a encrypted uh, black box, which uh, uh, which does its job in uh, in perfect isolation. It is probably a good thing uh, you could uh, have in your uh, portfolio when approaching uh, such uh, um, organizations like uh, banks or, or healthcare. So uh, to go forward to the main topic, what we want to do, we already have our um, uh, our product published on the marketplace, but as a consulting services, we want to make it as a cloud offer in, in terms of either managed service or uh, managed uh, application and probably use uh, Azure Lighthouse for, uh, for that. And uh, here is where uh, uh, Stan could uh, help uh, a bit, I guess, because he has uh, at least uh, some experience with uh, with Lighthouse. But uh, me myself, uh, uh, I am on uh, on that. I want to do it, but I don't think that I'm at the level of uh, giving any uh, any clues, any um, explanations or guidance on how to do it. So uh, if you have, Antonio said that you're having a, an, an honest opinion on all of the topics, uh, so if you could uh, share something in this area, if you know, but at least for me, this was uh, for a new or so, uh, it's really a challenge to find a, an example or good documentation or walk through how to do it. Yeah. Uh, so first uh, to explain the connection with the Azure Marketplace. Um, there are two basically uh, Azure Marketplace offers that you can use for that kind of uh, thing, and it really depends on uh, what kind of limitations you're going to hit with some of these offers. So basically, the Azure Marketplace is, uh, is divided into different offers that you can uh, publish there. Uh, of course, you have to be a company and et cetera, uh, all these things. Uh, but for example, you can publish a consulting offer, which basically is just uh, um, a page where you see your company logo and what your company does, what kind of um, services it provides, and someone can contact you in order to provide those services to them. So that's just the simplest maybe offer that you can publish there. Uh, but there are more advanced, like uh, being able to publish, um, let's say, a Lighthouse or a managed service, or uh, publish something called uh, managed, uh, managed app or managed application. Um, 
both of these things are basically are giving you some kind of access to deploy resources to the customer. Uh, I will not go particularly into the managed app, um, but yeah, both of these offers you can actually deploy even without marketplace, and then once you're ready, you can basically um, go and deploy them through the marketplace. Um, but for um, uh, for that case that you have described, um, basically let's let's go through Lighthouse and what kind of Lighthouse can offer. So the way that Lighthouse works is that uh, you have uh, two tenants, let's say one tenant is the customer and the other tenant is, is the partner or the service provider or the ISV, uh, whatever you call it. Um, these are two different tenants, they have their own subscriptions and their own major ATs, of course. Um, what the, the customer can do is go and deploy a Lighthouse resource that basically describes that uh, I want to give uh, to that tenant, uh, the partner tenant or the ISV tenant, uh, access to these and these subscriptions or resource groups, uh, to these and these uh, AD groups, users in the, in the partner uh, ISV tenant. Uh, and then uh, what happens is that once that resource is deployed and that access is given, Basically, the partner, right, the ISV, uh, sees those resources and those subscriptions like it's, uh, it's their own, its own subscriptions. Um, so I, can I share my screen, actually? Let me try. There is a button at, at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, do you see my screen? Not yet. I, I do believe that uh, Mikhail needs to add that basically as an operator and change the layout. And while he's doing that, let me actually ask probably one more question related to Lighthouse. Because in one hand, I, I like that service and I can understand all the benefits of the Lighthouse. Uh, and the, surf, the, the service itself is awesome. But still, my rule of thumb is if you can avoid it, avoid it at all cost. So I would also like, actually, I mean, like, that was that honest and personal opinion that in one hand, I, I like the service, I know all the benefits, but if I have an option to avoid it, I always avoid it. So I would also like to hear maybe, why like, you, why why also, opinion on that one. Why would be the case? Do you have some uh, arguments? Why should it be avoided? I would like or? to give a, an example to, to Anton. Uh, our this is to um, because we're always challenged okay guys can you provide a sufficient uh, amount of, uh, of security or uh, or whatever this is the cloud who has access to my data how are you going to, to split uh, the bill if we are going to a software as a service model and we decided okay fine each um, each customer will have uh, their deployment in their uh, own subscription. So everything uh, you decide uh, uh, who has access to uh, to services, to pieces of data, and uh, you have the bill, and you're in, uh, completely in control of uh, of what uh, of what you spend. Then, uh, if you want to scale and go for, uh, let us say, I don't know, fifty. How are you going to manage uh, 50 or 100 subscriptions? Uh, you're going to deploy. You need. How are you going to deploy new versions with new resources? You need to uh, to deploy new logic app, for example, to do something for a new feature or uh, to uh, to have a new uh, subscription on IoT Hub. How are you going to do this uh, if you want to to avoid this? Uh, have uh, um, a kind of um, a registry of. Uh, external users to each separate and manage uh, each separate uh, subscription uh, on its own. I mean, if you want to scale, how would you approach without Lighthouse? Uh, yes, yeah, so let's actually uh, split that conversation into two parts probably. So the first part will be uh, I don't know, let's call it development, but the name itself is not good as well. Uh, but okay, let, let, let's stick with the development for now. And the second one is operation. In terms of operation, uh, I see that uh, it's almost unavoidable, especially if you're working in such highly regulated environment as uh, bank, 
the b b banking sector, for example, okay? But in terms of development, if I need just to deploy something and then, for example, the client wants to manage that, because I do have those uh, solutions in uh, with, with my client as well. For example, when we will let's say help them to provision the environment, we will have we will help to set everything up. But then it will be up to them, up to their internal team, uh, to basically operate that environment. In those cases, if I can avoid lighthouse, I usually try to avoid that. Okay. That yeah, uh, Michael, is my screen shared or? Yes, I will do that uh, now. We see. Okay. It. Okay. So imagine that this window it's small, is. However. Um, yeah, can you please zoom it in? Maybe like two times. <laughs> Uh, or maybe you can just that should be part of the stream, I guess, um, because my screen is just a regular one. No, no, I mean, like, if you can just uh, zoom it in in your browser and use something like 200% zoom in your browser, that will be extremely valuable. Is that better? Uh, yeah, can you do that a bit more? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I have an extremely old eyes. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate okay. it. So imagine that this window is me as a service provider. And as you can see here, I have uh, customers that I have onboarded. Particularly, I have onboarded to this customer. And if I go and see the delegations of that customer, I can actually see uh, different subscriptions. I basically have an access to them. Uh, you can see that they have access to um, this subscription um, and these resource gr these uh, groups, which are in uh, the partner ISV, uh, these are uh, the ones that have different kind of access to, to that subscription. Uh, from here, you can see um, that my tenant is, is this one, but I actually have selected uh, this tenant and the subscriptions for that, uh, for that uh, tenant. So, uh, Sentia Denmark and Sentia Denmark CSP Shared Services, these are two different uh, tenants. Uh, Sentia Denmark is the partner, the ISV, and Sentia Denmark CSP Shared Services is the customer. Uh, so that's why I see my customers here. And if I want to, I can go and um, do any kind of things like deploy different services and, and manage them and so on um, from, from this perspective. Of course, this you can assign uh, permissions to service principles that are located in your uh, partner AED. And then, for example, you can use CI, CD to, to manage those resources. Uh, if you go here, now you can see I'm actually selected in the Sentia Denmark CSP shared services. So this means that now I'm acting as a customer. If I go to uh, service provider, um, I can actually see that service provider who has access to my resources and to which resources it has access. We just have to wait a few seconds to load. Yeah, as you can see here, I have this service provider uh, that has access to different subscriptions. I can go and see the delegations. For example, I can see that they have access to this subscription and uh, the same groups that you see there, they are now here, and uh, basically people can see um, these are the, the groups that have access to my resources. I can give access on subscription level, I can give access on resource group level, so if you want, you can limit uh, a partner or ISV to have access only to specific resource groups. Uh, you can give them access maybe reader on subscription level and more, uh, let's say, contributor on specific resource group. That's also possible. Um, and from there, I can see the same resources. So basically, uh, two different tenants, they have access to the same resources. Uh, but when we look at with the partner view, basically, these are projected resources. Uh, and, and that's how you can, for example, as an ISV, in, 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 um, you can basically go and um, create. Uh, Stump, the, yeah. uh, what, what do you usually perform on the link? Uh, mm, subscriptions, uh, the customer subscriptions. What activities do you perform there? I mean, uh, why we, do you need Lighthouse? 
Yeah. Your case. Uh, you can pre pre perform any kind of activities. You can perform deployments. You can perform uh, any kind of operations, like even restarting VMs. Uh, usually, the most common case is that um, you have a MSP or a managed service provider uh, that you have hired to manage and deploy resources on on, your, uh, on, on their behalf, and then the the customer gives access to the to the provider via Lighthouse. That's the most common uh, scenario. Uh, but there are other scenarios like um, a customer may have two tenants, and you want to have identities only on the one tenant. Then you're gonna go and uh, use Lighthouse to uh, manage um, the resources in the other tenant for which they don't want to create uh, another identity for uh, for uh, their uh, teams. Uh, and the other, you told me that it costs nothing uh, yes. in addition. Uh, so Lighthouse uh, is free. Manage uh, manage uh, app uh, application is also free. Uh, so these are basically free um, uh, free resources. And, because the official uh, information is that uh, if when you go and click on pricing, it says ask no. contact us to get. No, it's free. In, when you publish them to our marketplace, you basically publish uh, some. Uh, some resources that uh, basically are on pay. And let me see if I can find the. Uh, the resource provider. Um, yeah, so these, these are basically examples of, of how you can do such kind of deployment. Um, there should be some somewhere link here. Yeah, for example, this is one template. Um, this is the resource provider. So you basically create uh, two resources. One is registration definition that basically defines uh, what kind of access you want to get. So defining the different uh, different uh, groups that you want to add access, and the registration assignment uh, is basically um, the actual assignment that you do either on subscription level or on resource group level, uh, and then this registration assignment is linked to the registration definition. So you. You can create multiple registration definitions, so you can add different kind of accesses and uh, do different uh, registration assignments. Um, when you have such kind of template, you basically uh, you either build it in the marketplace. So um, actually, let me go and uh, show you how this looks in the marketplace as well. I think it has some kind of offer maybe there, or I have information. How to do it? Here, just stop sharing and find the uh, information. Mike, Mike uh, Stan is Stan not sharing. sharing. Yeah, I stopped the sharing. Not available. Available. I stopped the sharing until uh, find the right thing. Ah, okay. So basically, I'm not sure how many of you uh, had a similar challenge, uh, but uh, that one uh, really 
challenged uh, challenged us uh, and uh, uh, yes it we are we're still not uh, at the point of uh, monetizing these uh, these offers uh so stan uh, what you're going to to show uh is it uh, also uh involving some kind of uh billing or you're uh, handling billing in some manual way uh billing with these kind of offers you have to handle on your own um meaning that either you have some kind of process of extracting the data that you want to build upon and then um and then uh, calculate that and send the invoices to your customers. Uh, and the other way is um, you um, do this some kind of manual way. Um, overall, whatever you have access, uh, we have that that you can use to uh, make make up your billing invoice. But it's it's separate um, thing. So I'm expecting if Stani will share something. Yeah, just trying to find the link because I haven't used the marketplace and they have changed the the portal. So should we recap on my honest opinion? <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, uh, yeah, let's probably talk uh, a bit about that because I also see that uh, Mr. Emil and Mr. Michal also joined us from Poland. Uh, so maybe we can also invite them to participate in that part of the conversation. So uh, maybe like 10 minutes ago or something like that, I provide an honest, but it seems like a bit unpopular opinion. Uh, on Asia Lighthouse in a way that I do see the value of Asia Lighthouse when it comes to operate Samsung, especially on a bigger scale. Uh, but if I can avoid that during the deployment stage, I will always try to, to do that. I will always try to avoid that if I can. So guys, uh, did you have any experience before with that service? Do you have uh, any opinion on that one? Michel? No. And by the way, sorry for throwing you under the bus. <laughs> no problem. Uh, it depends on context, uh, I think. Uh, some things, yes, uh, but uh, it was not so really wide used on production, let's say. Uh, that's all. You know, I have really broad specializations, mostly on infrastructure, so... <laughs> yeah. Can you see my screen again? No, now, now people see me. <laughs> yeah. And I, I will surprise you, Anton, I do not have any experience with Lighthouse. <laughs> uh, oh, so that, I, for the nice. last three years... Right now. Yeah. Yeah, as for the last three years, I work for internal co clients, so we don't oh, use the lighthouse you? because we, <laughs> we don't need the lighthouse at all. Yeah, we, we've been testing lighthouse uh, as a s potential solution. Uh, I'm working with a team who has a lot of clients, in fact, uh, but never considered lighthouse as a um, first option. Always, it was like you know, guest in a tenant or service principles. Uh, and to be honest, uh, in most cases, client is forcing our teammates to have an account in their tenant. You know, this is uh, old stuff from old times when on-premises Active Directory domains. Rules I can the confirm world. we started that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, we started that way, but at some point of time, uh, now it seems unmanageable to me. So I'm trying to find the, yes. the solution yeah. in Lighthouse. I mean, Lighthouse, uh, not, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah, wait. Lighthouse resolved the issue with the scaling, which is a problem for many partners and many ISVs. If you work on a 
project to project basis, yeah, I guess the count is okay because then you finish one project and you're already gone on uh, with that guest account. You don't longer need. Um, but for for uh, partners who actually try to win the trusted um, to be the trusted advisor of the customer, they have to go and provide ongoing services. Um, the same for for ISVs, and that's where uh, White House comes in because also White House is very transparent on what kind of permissions you can become given, and at any time you can also cancel uh, those permissions uh, if needed. Any activity that you log as a, let's say, as a partner or ISV is also logged in the resources of the customer, so they know exactly what you have uh, done. Um, is my screen shared again? Yes, yes, yes there was small uh, issue with connection. Yeah. Mm. So you can go and do a managed service uh, offer, and then you go with um, this UI, you have to provide some uh, ID. Let's create that. As you can see, as I said, there are different types of offer. This is the managed service. And now, now you have to go through UI of basically selecting um, the different input for that specific service. Um, in the end, uh, what uh, it builds is basically uh, is going to uh, okay, the customer can go through. Because, uh, uh, so we see it poorly. Um, could you just you have to uh, go the uh, yeah. Can you please elaborate a little bit what you're doing because uh, the resolution is uh, yeah. quite poor. Is that better? Okay, so, so you're creating a new a new offer on behalf of Sentia. I'm just clicking uh, through different places until I... You seem to be in yes. the partner center publishing a new offer. Yes. And you have different inputs here that you need to provide for your so, like, these, these description offers, we summary. Have seen them, but uh, uh, where do you where do you specify the deployment? Yes. Yeah, we're technical people. That's the interesting uh, part of the topic. Yes. So you. So where it's, where it's different is the plan. So let's say plan one, two, three. Um, so offer setup, offer listings, and so on. These are the same one, no matter what kind of offer you choose. Um, but the plan will be different because you have to provide uh, different input. Uh, so let's and go. To technical configuration menu. So now this is a different part when you have the managed service offer, right? So you have to have version. Uh, let's say this is zero one. Uh, the tenant ID, this will be the, your tenant ID as an ISV. You're going to enter that information uh, here. Uh, and let's do this for the sake of continuing. All right. Uh, and then you, you want to provide authorization. As you saw from the template that I showed here, you have authorizations. And this is where you fill that part. So. Principal ID is the, the uh, ID of the Azure AD object or the Azure AD uh, user or the Azure AD service principal in your tenant, so in your tenant. And you have to provide uh, that information. Uh, you have to put some display name and you have to see and have to choose what kind of role you want to uh, 
have for that kind of user or for that group and so and etc and here you can add uh, in this case to maximum of 20 authorization and then once you publish and go find that offer as a customer uh, you'll be able to see all that information and you'll be able to deploy that offer and once the customer deploys that offer you get access uh, to the customer uh, keep in mind that this is a, a voluntary customer deployment the customer can choose not to deploy this uh, there are even um, ways that you can uh, have Azure policies that basically block uh, um, any uh, Lighthouse deployments or they block um, on, or they allow only specific partners that you want to use or specific templates that you want to use uh, for your customer. So you can uh, fully uh, secure these kind of things without having to um, allow access to someone that you don't want to. So any, so, any technical, technical configuration, okay, any, any plan you publish, plan you publish is, uh, is originates from, uh, from Lighthouse. Lighthouse. I mean, you cannot, you cannot publish, publish other plan which is not related to Lighthouse. I mean, we're telling uh, Lighthouse at all. I mean, it's obviously this is, not... This is the specific offer. So, so the managed service offer allows you to publish only plans that are Lighthouse plans, basically. So allows you to see only that, that kind of I thought of that it's managed up, okay. Managed service is always Lighthouse. I thought that... No, it's uh, managed service is... Yes. Yeah. The off, as I said initially on the on the introduction, uh, Marketplace supports different kind of offers that you can uh, use. Uh, you have to f basically comply with the rules of these offers and you cannot deploy anything outside that is not allowed out of these offers. Uh, and because of that, Lighthouse is the most, uh, let's say, cleanest way to have uh, an access directly to the customer and then go and deploy your own uh, your own uh, services that you want to provide to the customer okay Stan, thank you for uh, for that probably the other the other guys uh, in the conversation would uh, also you. like to add something but uh, uh, for me personally that was uh, that was useful because I can uh, confirm I'm having a challenge which uh, this one is addressing. Thank you, Evelyn, for this uh, actually interesting topic. And I would like to go to another very interesting person, uh, Michal, because he's the guy who actually is driving open source Python and some interesting stuff in Azure. And it is something which we really want to promote much more because uh, open source, uh, different technologies which are not related exactly with .NET, for example, um, are with good, great opportunity to run on Azure. So, uh, Michael, can you share some experience? What people need to know if they have uh, some open source solutions and want to run it on Azure? Yeah, we have at least uh, four streams, I think, uh, in uh, answer for your question. Uh, first stream is uh, about running a typical application on Azure, like uh, it don't need to be a web application. In fact, an, an API or or, or backend for, for, for web application. Uh, it can be a console application or something. So we have few options here and all of uh, those options are working great. Uh, standard, it's virtual machines and virtual machine scale sets, a classic approach uh, working from, from the beginning, from times of, of uh, cloud services, in fact. So from the beginning of, of Azure. So here, no changes, uh, no Azure related impact, in fact, because it's a really interoperational uh, environment. Just VM doesn't matter if Windows or, or other. Uh, so uh, let's keep it aside from the other. Uh, next, we have uh, Kubernetes services. Of course, it works uh, great. Also, interoperational approach. 
uh, it does not matter so much if Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster is running on Azure or uh, in other cloud on, on premises. So here, a lot of options, uh, very popular. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's not uh, so .NET related environment. So it was not born uh, under a Microsoft flag. So natural, uh, it, it is used for for open source stacks, let's say .NET, of course, is open source right now. So uh, we should call it uh, in a different way. So classical open source stacks, let's say. OK, uh, next we have um, Azure App Services. Uh, and here we see a lot of changes last years, right now, but also last months and weeks. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it was not so simple to run other applications than uh, .NET or maybe Node.js on, on web apps. Right now, today, uh, it's quite different. Uh, it is equally based on um managed approach and and mm, containerized approach so we can use uh, every code for our application in fact on on uh, web apps to run our web applications of course it, it's limited uh, it's not so uh, extensible and and uh, Oh, easy to use with not standardized uh, ports, let's say, and, and um, configs like on web, like we have on the web apps. So um, it will be much easier to run it on uh, AKS, but on the web apps, it's uh, managed almost in 100%. So it's easy to use uh, short time to, to the market from, from the beginning of the project. And uh, today we have no problems with, yes, sure. Uh, have you had uh, sufficient experience? I mean, uh, ACI is sometimes uh, a preferred alternative of AKS, but uh, I have a really, really bad experience with uh, container instance, ACI. Uh, have you had any uh, good experience with ACI? I mean, uh, the pricing of it is completely unpredictable, completely. And it's yeah, uh, but 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 if you will count seven hundred thirty um, hours uh, per month, it will be cheaper than virtual machine. So if you will treat it as a virtual machine. In fact, it, it will be OK. Uh, it's not so, um, again, it's not so extensible as a virtual machine. In fact, uh, you are limited. But I have good experience in production with ACI for some stuff, not web stuff, not API stuff, but. We uh, APIs. Uh, uh, for machine learning, we deployed them uh, by mistake in ACI, and we had to pay 700 euro per month for uh, somewhat six APIs because uh, every uh, resource is rounded up to full CPU. Uh, I mean, if it if it's consuming uh, 0.1 CPU, it's rounded up to one CPU, and this wasn't uh, according to the initial pricing policy, and we complained to Microsoft, and they. Uh, I mean, we also added it as a suggestion to improve this in the documentation. But this uh, was uh, that is four times uh, more expensive than uh, than expected in our case. And of course, yeah. we understood it at the end of the month because we didn't expect it at all. Sure, uh, but... I'm using it as as a proxy for for nothing um, when communicating with on-premises environments using integrate, uh, integrated integrated. Um, Service environments for for logic apps. Uh, if we need to not uh, network traffic, we are using ACIs, and and it performs really good. We we have a number of cores and uh, memory hard coded, so it's predictable. I'm also using ACIs for for machine learning uh, when uh, scoring a model or teaching a model. Uh, but also then it, it's hard coded and it is running once a month and once a day, uh, once a day for scoring, once a month for for, for learning. Uh, so uh, I think 
my scenarios are, are different a little bit from yours. So you need to uh, be aware that it is not so uh, predictable as VMs, yes. Uh, and uh, no one should be afraid of VMs in Azure, in fact, because uh, to be honest, I don't see the reason to use um, ACIs instead of VMs. If you are um, creating some uh, mechanism which is uh, automating uh, process of machine learning or, or creating any uh, proxies or APIs that are needed during the month or not whole month, why you cannot automate it on VMs? In fact, uh, you don't need to administer those VMs like, like in traditional way. Uh, you can just automate it with extensions or, or clouding it, uh, and it will work totally as a as, as a container. In fact, you can run Docker on this VM and automate it much more further than just deploying a code on a VM. Not speaking about creating uh, images for for running some workloads. So. Um, ACI seems to be good, uh, especially with con uh, connected to, to AKS clusters as a virtual kubelet. But be aware that virtual kubelet is problematic right now in production. It's not working as as you probably uh, supposed to see be working on on, um, on production environment. So uh, I will not say that that ACI and virtual kubelet is production ready. So be aware. OK, uh, so uh, next, we have two more streams uh, speaking about Python or, or any other uh, open uh, programming uh, stack or, or language in, in matter of Azure, because we have uh, the whole data stack in Azure. Python, in fact, is uh, conquering the data landscape in Azure and not only in Azure. Uh, if we are speaking about uh, Databricks, if we are speaking about HD Insight, uh, uh, Synapse, uh, probably Excel uh, in the near future, uh, we are speaking about Python. So programming the data layer and, and uh, data warehousing analysis uh, in Azure context using Python. So uh, it feels really good in Azure environment. It's well developed. Uh, Guido von Rosum is, is working for Microsoft right now. So uh, world is changing or changed, in fact. And uh, I think the last stream of, of the answer is using the Python or other uh, language other than .NET in a context of uh, Azure is using Azure SDKs for for um, your language of choice. Let's say it's Python for me. In fact, it is because I'm using Python to automate Azure tasks. So I'm not using Terraform. I don't like Terraform, in fact. Um, uh, I'm not using um, uh, Bicep because I'm not aligned with, with the development of the project. I'm not working as a DevOps or Ops, in fact, uh, in daily basis um, in my work. Uh, so I'm not looking around with with new stuff uh, in Azure, in, in DevOps, in Ops, in Automate, and, and so on. I'm So for every task I'm automating in Azure for myself, or sometimes for clients, I'm using Python and Python SDK you know, for Azure. Uh, it works great. Uh, it is changing a lot um, nowadays, and uh, there is a great team in Microsoft responsible for uh, Python SDK. Uh, it is. It seems to be aligned a little bit to .NET uh, SDK today to give uh, people a feeling that all the SDKs are quite similar. Two, three years ago, it, it was not going that way. Every SDK was uh, quite different. Uh, and today, all the SDK teams are working on alignment. So if you are working with .NET today and you will be forced to use Python or, or JavaScript uh, tomorrow in your project with, with Azure SDK, 
you should feel that that uh, you know where to to look uh, out the, the classes or, or methods or, or functions uh, does not matter how, how uh, it's named in your language uh, it will be similar so it's the same tool but but maybe the, the same environment the same development environment but other tool uh, like you know hammer or screwdriver it, you, you should know how to use both and it should not be uh, so problematic. So I think, yes, we have four four streams. So running up application uh, data uh, using SDKs and uh, running uh, applications in the classic mode, not looking that we are working in, uh, in Azure. So in all four streams, I think we are on, on the, Good path. <laughs> Everything is going uh, for Python. I don't know how it is. Let's say for PHP. Uh, I remember old time when when PHP SDK was uh, mm, not having a lot of love from Microsoft product groups. Let's say. I don't know how it is uh, today. I know that the GoLang is having SDK. It's well developed. Um, I know that JavaScript SDK is well developed. I know that Java SDK is well developed. Of course, .NET uh, it's probably perfectly developed. Looking on, on the other uh, in in uh, on GitHub, yeah. So I believe I answered your question. Uh, Michael, I have yeah. one more question because you are also expert in the context of hybrid hybrid cloud. Can you share your experience what uh, exactly people can consider in this case when they are uh, designing uh, hybrid solutions? Okay, uh, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's uh, th there's probably uh, some kind of hype today for for hybrid environments, not only on the market but also in Microsoft. Uh, on the market, of course, uh, hybrid environment sh should be something natural because our clients, maybe you, in my case, uh, a little bit. Uh, also, we have uh, investments in uh, hardware our data center or some kind of collocation or, or something like this so we have bare metals we have virtualization on premises uh, or somewhere in uh i okay some people had the, their environments in ovh but right now it can be a little bit problematic for them uh but uh, building uh, stuff like this, like, like hybrid environments, we have uh, two things uh, we can cover. The first one is, is connecting our environment to Azure or other clouds uh, to communicate with Azure services. And it's quite natural today for clients uh, that they are just asking for it because uh, there is a demand for, for solutions like this. So maybe I, I will leave it because it's, it's the simplest um, uh, scenario. The second one is to uh, is a situation when clients are having um, on-premises environment, they are connected to Azure to expand the, the infrastructure, let's say for VMs, networking and so on. So it's natural way. And they want to expand to uh, manage services in Azure to leverage cloud tools for uh, monitoring, for compliance, for uh, operations, and so on. So, uh, in simple words, I'm speaking about uh, Azure Arc uh, and Azure Monitor, Log Analytics, um, uh, Azure Defender, so Security Center with the uh, name changed last uh, Ignite. Uh, so the hybrid is not only infrastructure and networking, but, but also uh, cloud services, uh, managed services uh, used to uh, control on-premises environment. And the third scenario, we are working uh, mostly today with Microsoft and clients on, uh, is uh, Azure Stack HCI. 
so hyper-converged infrastructure, and Azure Stack Hub. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not working with Azure Stack Hub. I don't like it, clients don't like it, uh, and this is, uh, I think, common situation all over the world. So Azure Stack HCI is a good option if you want to create uh, Azure aware on-premises environment. So you want to govern data on-premises, you want to have it in your building, or somewhere, somewhere uh, near your building uh, because of networking, because of regulations or something, it doesn't matter. But you want to have a um, complementary environment where Azure is aware of on-premises and on-premises are aware of Azure together. So uh, a piece of Azure in, in on-premises connected to Azure, governed from Azure, automated from Azure, and uh, AKS, it, it's a good um, good point here because you can extend your AKS from, from Azure to on-premises automated together, govern it together, uh, use uh, monitoring, use defenders, and so on. So if client is aware of Azure and want to use Azure, want to use Azure in a public cloud, but also want to govern data or applications on premises because of networking or, or data um, uh, placement, the HCI is, is uh, best option. We are um, triggering, I think, three production environments this month and next month here in Poland uh, for big organizations, uh, both working on the old hardware, old, let's say, old, so already owned uh, hardware and new certified hardware from uh, all going to be bought from, from, from uh, the manufacturer. So uh, it's a good time to start with, with uh, hybrid environments. Uh, it's a good time to, to give a chance to Azure Stack, Azure Stack HCI, not Azure Stack Hub. In my opinion, private opinion, maybe th there are clients who, who love um, Hub, but I'm not the one of them. Michal, I would actually like to ask you one question on this specifically hybrid scenario. You know, uh, technically, I actually ask uh, that question even on the interview, but of course, we're not on an interview right now, but I just want to know your honest opinion because you definitely have more experience than I do on this topic. Okay, so let's say that you have a hybrid scenario. And of course, we know that if we will use Docker, uh, especially as a delivery platform, so we can, for example, containerize all our applications and then we can host them either on premise or in the cloud, and that will be super transparent. And that works perfectly with one minor detail that works perfectly for the stateless applications. Yeah. But now we need to have something stateful, let's say like a database, okay? And uh, in terms of Azure, for example, we have like managed services, so we can go with Azure databases, we can go with Cosmos, we can go with any other kinds and flavors of, their, uh, of uh, databases that, that are there. But still, uh, some companies still prefer to have their database also in a Docker container and host it in the, the Kubernetes environment, uh, maybe in a dedicated node pool and stuff like that. So what is your opinion? What is your recommendation? If I want to have a hybrid module, but I still want to use, let's say, the benefits of the cloud, how should I proceed in general? Yeah, uh, it depends on characteristics of your applications. It, it, it's my opinion, it, it, it will not always fit uh, the hybrid approach. Um, I see it in banks, in fact, and it's not a, it's not a bad situation. All, almost all people thinking about the banking and cloud things that nothing is possible and, and always uh, on-premises is winning, but uh, hybrid solutions uh, fits really good for banks. And the question you just asked, it's a daily basis discussion in, in, in banks 
for me, let's say, I don't know it's for everyone, but, but for me, and the database approach. Because in banks, in most cases, uh, there is no uh, synchronous um, uh, operations. Almost all things uh, going under the hood of um, online banking, let's say, is, um, is it's going to be made through the some uh, enterprise service bus kind of, it doesn't matter how, how it is uh, um, implemented. Uh, so if you have any kind of uh, service bus, enterprise service bus or integration services, kind of, uh, it's uh, much simpler to implement hybrid environment. When you have uh, part of your application or in, in a cloud uh, somewhere in, let's say, Netherlands and uh, part on premises in your data center, for me in Poland, for you, it can be any other country. So we have a lot of kilometers be between environments and we need to be aware about uh, networking uh, of it. So with, um, if you have uh, um, any integration services, it will be easy. If you don't have stuff like this, and you are, uh, you need to fit to to classical three-layer um, architecture with with database, middleware, and and some uh, front end, probably you need to think about synchronizing uh, databases you have under the hood and uh, depends on what databases engine you are using probably it will be different approach for for project like this and of course there is a third solution where you have databases or your uh, state base just in one location and your second location is communicating with with the uh, to the first one and uh, here we have question if the public cloud is your first <laughs> uh, location or on-premises is your first location. How far uh, locations uh, are mm, uh, from each other and how uh, your application is uh, treating uh, problems with connections or uh, delays on connections. Yeah, so, so it depends on application. And we need uh, to say it loud, I think, uh, not every application is ready to be moved to the public cloud first. Not every application is ready to be moved to the hybrid um, architecture. And uh, not every uh, application should be considered as a, a good uh, to move or, or to change this architecture. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, it, it don't need to be a legacy uh, application, in fact. Some applications are created uh, with on-premises in mind, some applications are created with cloud in mind, so you will not be able to run it on-premises. Uh, this, this is nowadays, in fact, uh, and we are probably all working on uh, the landscape like this, creating cloud-native uh, solutions not possible to run on-premises. And uh, we have um, applications, whole systems, which cannot be uh, running in, in an environment where we are, uh, where there even is possibility to have a networking problems like you know stock exchange yeah it will be really problematic to run it in a public cloud on, on hybrid environment i think for many years starting from today probably maybe in 10 years maybe 20 years we will be ready to run it in a public cloud because of networking software defined networking software defined storage software defined everything so not everything is uh, ready to be moved to the cloud or hybrid environment. Let me probably okay. ask you one, one more question to finalize on this topic. This is the simple yes and no question. Uh, have you ever seen that what they're usually talking about, that if you will use Kubernetes, you will be able to do a drag and drop from your on-premise to cloud. Have you ever seen that working? <laughs> no fucking <laughs> way. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's a unicorn. Uh, it it yeah. was never true, in fact. Uh, 
uh, might be a little bit marketing from, from <laughs> cloud vendors and so on, but it was never true uh, for me, that's my opinion. My, that's my experience as well. Thanks. Guys, I think that we are already close to the end of this session, but I would like uh, each of you to share some recommendations to our uh, attendees at the end before to stop. So uh, please go ahead, probably Michael with you because you are actually on the screen now. Okay, so do your backups, uh, plan your disaster recovery, and that's all for, for this month, I think. Anton? Good advice. Yeah, uh, from my side, I will probably repeat the same advice that I provided at the beginning of our conversation is that uh, especially if you just starting with the cloud or if you're starting with some new services in the cloud, in the, in the cloud that you never worked before, go and at least check the best practices from the Microsoft. I've been working with Azure for more than 10 years for now. And of course, 10 years ago, the documentation and the best practices, let's say uh, there were a lot of room for improvements, but currently uh, the documentation is much better than it is 10 years ago. And there are a lot of useful things there. So go and at least check the best practices. That will be my advice. Thank you very much for these good recommendations. It was really awesome event. Thank you for everything, for this contribution, sharing of experience, and hope that you will join again pretty soon after a few months for the next edition of Azure MVP Unplugged. Thank you. Thank you. I can say that I will join as soon as you will invite me. That's the connection. You will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thanks you, and have a nice evening. Have a nice evening, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.